there are men who lurk in the background of Scotland's history. You see, history isn't just big men doing great things, but unknown influencers in the shadows. How were our towns and cities built? What was the connection between kings and common people? How did quiet figures run Scotland down the centuries? Who were they? And do they walk amongst us today? This is their story. In this video, I want to expose the movers and shakers of the past. I'm going to show you the living evidence of the clash between them and royal power. And I'm going to unmask some of their operatives today. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to be told when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. I could have made this video in several places in Scotland. You'll find these people everywhere. But I can't think of a better place than my hometown of Perth. So I'm heading to the AK Bell Library for evidence of where power resided when this town was formed. In the early 12th century, David I was a transformational King of Scots. He famously brought Norman and Flemish knights to impose a new feudal order in his kingdom. This ensured his control of our land. And he did something else as well. David I set up royal boroughs. He established them in Edinburgh, Stirling, Dumfries, Jedburgh, Dunfermline, Montrose, Lanark and here in Perth. These would establish David's control over the economy. As king, he wanted to encourage trade, but he also wanted to control where it was happening, how it was happening, and of course, to tax it. He did this with royal boroughs. Perth is perfectly located on the largest volume of river water flowing in Great Britain. It was as far up the River Tay as ships could reach but it was as far down as bridges could be built before that Tay widens out to form an estuary. And that bridge over the River Tay was essential to making traffic goods and bringing them from fertile hinterlands to the North Sea. And goods came from the continent in return. It's an ideal place to encourage trade. So a charter was issued giving Perth privileges to hold markets, to trade with the outside world, to enforce the rules of trade and collect the king's dues. Now, I don't know what was in David's original charter, but thanks to the lovely archivist at Perth Library, what I can show you is a later charter issued by David's grandson, William I. This is Perth's oldest existing charter from October 1209. In it, William I of Scotland grants privileges and sets out the regulations for the borough. It tells us who can trade, when they can trade, what limits there are on trading, how internationals can trade with the burgesses of the town, and of course, how taxes will be paid on that trade. The king is devolving some of his power and authority to local burgesses and it's the men of the merchant guild to whom power was passed in 1209 that interests us today. Now, William was probably given them more power than his granddad David had. You see here, in 1443, a later king, Robert II, issued a new charter in this charter, he grants the Burgesses all the king's revenues from the borough in return for £80 a year. Simpler. The king just takes a fee, you deal with all the detail, and if you can make a profit, good on you. So, being a member of the Merchant Guild brought an attractive opportunity to share in the profits from the borough trade. The next king, Robert III, issued a new charter and in this he grants to the borough the right to choose their own sheriff from amongst the burgesses. 
Not only that, but the sheriff can charge fines for rule breaking and the money raised should be used to maintain that crucial bridge across the River Tay. So we can see power and responsibilities transferring from the king to these burgess characters. It's not just trade and taxation, this is local government. So who are these people who are running the borough of Perth on behalf of the king? To tell you that, let me take you to the most significant place at the heart of this town to see a priceless item that's been brought there specially for us. If you ever wondered why our football team's called St Johnston, then it's because by the time James VI issued his charter in 1600, renewing this town's precedence over the town further along the Tay estuary, that was what our town was called. Because the tune grew up around St John's Kirk, where John Knox preached that eventful ceremony on idolatry in 1559. History reverberates around this building. Things have happened here that have changed Scotland and the world. And we can find the men who ran the borough in a priceless book. From its 13th century beginnings, the Merchant Guild or the Guildry ran all the affairs. And this locket book, there will be an exhibition in the new Perth Museum, has been the record of the Guildry since 1452. Written in Latin and Old Scots, it records the activities of the merchants who ran the town, who inherited their role from their father or bought their way in to a share of the borough's prosperity or might have been appointed for free because of some other status or service rendered. The book tells us of enforcement of weights and measures, street cleaning and town maintenance, shore porterage, recruitment in time of war, compensation paid to a guild member for the loss of his horse at the Battle of Solway Moss, and fines paid for the upkeep of that bridge. It's like a history of the town, the story of the merchant guild, a court record of fines and offences, evidence of charitable works, and the council administration records all rolled into one. Now remember, the same kind of thing would have been going on in other royal boroughs that I mentioned earlier. This is the story of the people who ran many towns up and down the country, from the boroughs established by David right through to the modern day. But only in Aberdeen and Dunfermline is there anything close to the record preserved in this wonderful book. It even gives us a clue to one of the most crucial events that changed the story of the British Isles. But you've probably never heard of it until today. But first, we can see in the current St John's Kirk the division that was set out in William I's Charter 800 years ago. It declared that the Burgesses of Perth were to have their merchant guild save for the fullers and weavers. Oh, there was a bit of snobbery about. You see, there were trade guilds, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers, tradesmen. Over on that side of the church, you can see the pews of the Glovers Incorporation that exists to this day in the town. The pew of the Taylors Incorporation are behind that and the Wrights Incorporation behind that. On the other side of the church is the pew of the Guildry, not tradesmen, but merchants, the shadowy figures who ran affairs down the centuries. The oldest bell in the upper belfry of this tower is from the 14th century, when the first Stuart King, Robert II, was issuing his charter that we saw earlier, increasing privileges and responsibilities of the Guildry. When the main bell up in the tower was bought from Flanders in 1506, James IV was on the throne, and the Dina Guild in Perth was John Bryson. When John Knox preached that Reformation launching sermon 
from this pulpit in 1559, the Dean of Guild was Patrick Adamson. When Cromwell's troops took Perth in 1651, it was Andrew Butter. When Perth was the base for the 1715 Jacobite uprising, Mark Wood was the Dean of Guild. And of course, when James's son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, arrived 30 years later, the rising made it one of the few years when there's no election of the Dean of Guild recorded in the book. Although by that time, some of the power of the Guild was waning. On a national level, Patrick Lord Ruthven was the man who led David Rizzio's murderers into the scene of the crime in Mary Queen of Scots' bedchambers. On a local level, he became Provost of Perth in 1547, and the power balance between the pews over there and the ones over here was changing. When James VI was on the throne, Gildry still had a powerful role. But here in St John's Town, the town council was gaining influence and prominence. There was a power struggle between these two bodies as to who got to appoint posts, who had influence over the other and who controlled what purse strings. At a time when James VI was becoming James I of England, there was conflict with Spain and the continent was approaching the Thirty Years' War, it's easy to forget that below the big men doing great things, most of the people in the country were just getting on with life. As they bought and sold and went to the market or football games or watched the great British Bake Off on the telly, the battle that raged around ordinary folk was who paid for the sewers, collected the fines, maintained that bridge, supported the folk that had been fallen in hard times. Who were these men of influence? For a century, that battle in Perth was between the town council and the guildry. But something happened here that changed the course of all our history. There's an event that's celebrated every year across Great Britain. An event that has similarities to, but is less significant than, what happened here in Perth in August 1600. Now, I've made a video about the incident that caused a rift between James VI and the people of Perth, and I urge you to watch that video at the end of this one. But those events were followed by an inquiry, which is the largest building in the town was held in this church, where many of the people of Perth were interrogated about their involvement. The consequences were genuinely global, but the future of the town itself must have hung in the balance. The Dean of Guild at that time was James Adamson. He must have let out a huge sigh of relief when King James renewed the Borough Charter of Perth a few months later when Perth is first recorded as something that places in Scotland hadn't typically been called before, a city. The preeminence of its position over Dundee was confirmed. James made a visit to Perth. He himself was made a Burgess. And here, in the locket book of the Gildry, we find his signature recording the event. When his grandson is crowned across the Tate Schoon 49 years later, we see his signature. You'll find the influence of these men of the Merchant Guild hidden in this and other towns, just like the Guildry Bell that sits in the bell tower here. Few people in this town will even know it's there amongst the other chimes, but without it, Every hour of the day, the sound of the city would be changed. Over time, the men of the Merchant Guild formed and maintained this town and others across the country. They were hugely influential in mould in Scotland. Some had been brought by David I from Flanders of England. Some had been local merchants. Most had inherited their membership of the Guildry from their fathers. Others had bought their way into memberships. Others still had rendered services or had been appointments enforced by the town council as it rose to power. But the men 
who are the inheritors of these early privileges of the Borough Charter still walk amongst us today. I say men, but in recent times, women have been allowed to join the Geldry. And this is Alex Cairncross, am I right? That's right. I can, because you were at the same school as me, eh? We were. You were but you've gone into higher things, haven't you? I became a member of the Guildry in October, and traditionally, membership passed from sons or son-in-law, from fathers to sons or son-in-laws, and last year a decision was made to invite ladies to join the Guildry, and in October there were ten of us. In October 2023, the Guildry joined the modern world. What a fantastic thing that is, eh? Now, you didn't look as if you're dressed up for the modern world. Michael, tell me about your, your get-up there. The robes that I wear just now, yeah. being the Lord Dean of Guild for Perth. And yeah. you're the current Lord Dean yes, of Guild? Yes, I'm the current Lord Dean of Guild. Uh, I serve for three Your years. name will go in the book. It will go, yes, yes. So these robes are magistrate's robes, and the chain, we call it the chain of office, but it goes back to the Baileys of Perth in the olden days. All the way back that we've been back. discussing yes. yeah. over the... So the tradition is that we have the robes in the chain and we wear them on. And the even chains. these are Victorian, I believe. The robes are Victorian. Uh -huh. The chain is slightly older. It's uh, 1791 when it was made. And the path continues all yes. the way through those years. And of course, Douglas, I know you, of course, because we grew up in the we same did, area. We did, in Craigie yeah. and Perth. That's yes, right. Indeed. Your big brother was in my big sister's class. That's correct, school. yes. But again, you've gone on to much more important things oh, than... Oh, indeed, uh, yes, uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, so I am the Guild Clerk. I'm the current Guild Clerk uh, for, for the Guildian Corporation of Perth. Um, and you got that position because you're your favour. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a Guildryman myself. Uh -huh. So, yes, that was a hereditary element of uh, over 800 years of of uh, hered hereditary membership. Passed on. Passed on, yeah. From so father just, to son. To son and so on. All the way back from uh, William the First to Charles to, the Third. Correct. Today. Correct. And of course, nowadays, the, the nature of the Guildry has changed. And Bill, I remember when we were running about as Bairns, you were baking the best pies in Perth. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had a broad crust in them. Oh, yes. Hey, hey, hey. Plenty of room for the beans. You didn't get that in the Murray's pie, do you? No. You didn't, right? But <laughs> I shouldn't have. I've upset all the Murray's pie eaters. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the Guildry nowadays is, is somewhat different from what has been in the past. What's the mean? In the past, we would look after our members. Uh -huh. That was all just like us. Whereas now, it's very much a charitable organisation. Uh -huh. And one of the biggest ones is to give bursaries for the kids in schools, uh -huh. which is a big thing, uh, and it really makes a big difference. Uh, so that's one of the biggest things. So the Guildry today continues to offer that charitable yeah. function yeah. to kids in Perth in that transition from going to school to, to help university, university and the continues to yeah. benefit the community. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there you go. In your town, you might have a guild hall. You've probably had craft uh, incorporations or guild days or whatever, in the, and they probably haven't as much power as they used to have. You probably don't even notice, but there's an invisible thread that's continued in Perth from 1209 all the way through to these guys who walk the streets with us today. And as a boy from Perth myself, I feel so proud that as we sit on the tea, we'll always be above Dundee. <laughs> There's another video coming up on screen now. You can support the channel by clicking top right to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, I mean, Doc, it's going to be a lamb alive. Cheerio and drastic. Well done,